When do you start ha having a relationship with your mom? I have patchy memories of being with my mom. I left home at 14, 15 because my father was abusive. Obviously, with the kind of background that I've had, I would definitely have psychological issues. So quite recently, you've lost your mom. Can you please take us through that moment? Where were you when you heard of your mom's passing? Um, my mom passed away in my car. Do you blame yourself for maybe like taking that along? Do you feel like you could have done something else, maybe like to possibly save her life? I think I will always do. I will never feel like I did enough. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Perspective with YouTube. Boom, 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 boom. Get ready to experience an award-winning musical force that defies convention and an activist spirit that demands change. Ooh, the one and the only, Sinkua Dana. Hailing from South Africa, Dana's music is a fusion of jazz and Afro soul, carrying poignant lyrics that challenge norms and ignite reflection. Mm. Her songs are more than melodies. They are anthems of cultural identity, justice, and womanhood. Join us on Perspective with ITU, darling, as we unravel the enigmatic artistry of Sinkua Dana. Through her companion music, she holds a mirror to society, urging us all to question, reflect, and evolve. Dana isn't just a guest, she's an embodiment of perspective, power, and purpose. Welcome to Perspective, Sumpu, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, too. Can we just talk about this thing? Eh, uh, half happened. <laughs> <laughs> it is so beautiful. Thank you. Does it have any meaning? Um, well, for the past two years, I have started um, celebrating ancient and eclectic um, African hairstyle. You know, um, my, my hairstylist and I, her name is Dumi. Um, she owns the Salon Afro Boutique. Yeah. We started on this journey, actually slightly over two years ago. Yeah. I'm exploring all of these different African styles from all over the continent, you know, to just showcase the beauty and sophistication yeah. of African art, you know, which transcends beyond, you know, it. Um, how art perhaps is a everyday life thing um, or aspect of our lives that even in our hair we showcase art when we work we sing along we, 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 everything comes with art and that, that therefore perhaps it becomes culture in that that way and yeah and it's so beautiful that we've always had these beautiful and exotic hairstyles. Mm -hmm. And I think many of us have, have um, regated it rather to something more Western and we don't appreciate it, right? Well, I mean, in, in many ways it's understandable. Um, our psyche is highly wounded. Um, our sense of identity is warped. Um, so it's going to take us being intentional sure. about wanting to love ourselves as we are. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And appreciate ourselves. Yes. Yeah. Because, well, I think that goes with that question. Of course. Yeah. Oh, but Dad, <laughs> Sophia, please take us back home when you were born in the Easter cake, right? Mm -hmm. Take us back home, how you grew up with both parents, your siblings, etc. I've always simply went home. And what's the name that they call you back at home? 
Well, um, I my earliest memories are mostly of my grandmother and, and grandfather. You know, those days your parents had to go and be far away to work and where they were, they couldn't stay with their kids. So most of us were sent to our grandparents. So I, say, I stayed with uh, my grandparents and there were a number of us from different mothers and different fathers, so cousins basically. We all stayed there um, um, in the village in Butterworth. That's where I grew up. I grew up um, the typical, you know, post uh, African child, you know, like when they, when in, in Europe and other parts of the world, they showcase Africa that barefoot child smiling with the uh, umfinya, <laughs> you know, like I was that child. Uh, we had a, we lived a very simple life. Uh, we got our water from the river. Um, we got, you know, wood from the forest to make our fire, to cook, etc., etc. We had a huge garden where we had everything. Literally, we even had grapes in our garden. I remember an apple tree, an orange tree. And we planted everything that we ate, most of it was from the ground that we tilled um, ourselves. So that's the kind of background, or rather my, um, my background. And um, my name that I'm called at home, even today, is Sinatemba. Oh, Sinatemba. Yeah. We've got hope, ne? Yeah. Oh, clever head. And then simply means a gift, I, I, ne? Yes. I do say, feel it. Yes. Ne? Yes. Yes. Refeel way, that gift. Or remofeel way. Yeah, yes. Remofeel. Yes. Ne? Yes. Remofeel ne? And then in September, we've got hope. Yes. Oh. Oh. We've got hope that you are a gift. Mm-hmm. Right? Oh, that is beautiful. Thank you. Yes. Oh, I love it. So when do you start ha- having a relationship with your mom? Like, where does that start, you know? Well, it was on- ongoing. You know, I have, you know, I have patchy memories of being with my mom. Uh, before I stayed with my grandparents when I was very small. You know, sometimes you actually do remember those memories. Yeah. Maybe I must have been true and how we lived and stuff. Um, my mom loved her children and it broke her heart that when we were small, like my sister and I at the time, she couldn't live with us, that when she did come, she would bring all of these big gifts, you know, and give us so much love that I would miss her so intensely when she was gone because I knew the love of of my mom, you know, there would be days I would stand by the gate the whole day thinking that if I miss her this much, this intensely, she must be coming that day. Most days that didn't happen, if not all the days, in in fact. Um, so it was challenging for a child. Um, and, you know, as children, we are highly connected to our mothers. There's like this bond, the Ngaba, you know, there's a strong connection. So when I missed my mom, I felt like I was dying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how did that affect you as a child? Like you're a child, and you just feel like, like, where's my mom? You know, like I really miss her. Like, how did that affect you? Well, I mean, I don't even know how to express that, but I do know that my grandparents, my grandmother, she actually was my step-grandmother, by the way, um, she filled that void. She tried. I think I was her favorite. She, you know, when she went to go collect her pension, she she would take me with. Uh, when she went to go fetch wood from the forest, she would take me with. She would pick me, you know, so she was secondary in that way, you know, um, but she could never completely fill like that void that that I felt. And I mean, I think I then grew up with some attachment issues, you know, that um, as an adult, I then had to deal with but attachment I- issues, abandonment issues, um, et cetera, et cetera. And 
with those conversations? Well, I didn't need to have them with my mom because I understood why she could not be there. You know, so there was nothing that I faulted her for. Um, rather, I had them with my therapist, you know, to try to understand how that affected my character as a person. Um, but I didn't fault my mom at all. You know, it was the system. It was just how the system was. Yeah. And I think that takes so much maturity for you as a child to say, I know why my mom is not here. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it still hurts. Mm -hmm. and you can still acknowledge that to quit because you know the reasons why mm -hmm. and to become selfless about it. Mm -hmm. I think that takes so much maturity, you know, in a child to say, when I get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I I did get it. Um, I mean, I was the firstborn as well, so that name Sinetemba is because I was the firstborn, so I was the hope yeah. that would bring everyone, fix everything, you know, be the the anchor. Um, so that's something that I I don't know carried from when I was very young. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know that you started discovering your identity when you were a teenager, right? Um, were these conversations that you wanted to have with your mom to say, um, I want to find who I am, like who is Smetenba, right? And now you start having these conversations. Were they conversations that you had with yourself only? Or were, were they conversations that you also had with your mom or wished you had with your mom? You know, I actually have always had a very strong sense of identity, of who I am. I've never really struggled with that yeah. to a point where knowing that I was a bit of an oddity as a person generally, you know, and I had no qualms with being that oddity. You know, I chose to just be by myself most of the time. You know, I was a loner. I had my dog, you know. <laughs> um, and I had a, also a very strong affinity to, how do I put this, to the God entity. I had a very strong bond with God that transcended um, religion from when I was very young. Um, so my focus was succeeding in life, you know, and making something of myself that my mother and God would be proud of. So um, being intentional about working hard and being a good person and um, creating an open communication between myself and, and the God entity. Mm -hmm. Is that when you saw it, the possibility of success? Because like when you're raised in a rural area, mm -hmm. right, you don't really see what success looks like. Mm -hmm. But then you get a chance like yourself, like we, you then started having a relationship with God. And then you're like, no, actually, I want to be successful. I want to be great. I want to be powerful. What's something that you got from your relationship with God? I want to, you know, I, I grew up feeling like, and this thing makes me believe in, in reincarnation because I grew up feeling like this is not my life. I remember one time I got angry at my mom and I said to her, you actually are not my parents. You must tell me now who my parents are. I want to go home. It must have been like eight. And I took my little bag and I left. <laughs> and I got to the taxi rank and I thought to myself, I'm just going to walk and I'm going to get home. Yeah. Somehow, if I feel this strongly about it, I'm just going to walk and I'll find it. Um, but that feeling of, you know, my life was not meant to be like this. Made 
that gave me a very strong sense of wanting to create the life that I believed was mine, right? And so, I mean, I was, I started saying with my mom when I was eight, um, in what is called a town village. You know, that village that has got one tar street. In those days, it didn't have tar, that street was just like a, um, a street um, in Solo. And um, so when I was eight and I started staying with my mom, that is when my relationship with, with God then intensified. You know, and I also got introduced a lot to um, books, right? And it is those books that made that made me aware that the world is so much bigger, you know, than where I am right now, and that world is reachable, and that's the, that is what also propelled me then to, you know, I can get out, I can do it myself, you know. Um, it, it, it felt like it was a world that was very far away, but with effort, I could reach that world. So I worked towards doing that, and I did it. Yes. Ken, oh, and then the, I love what you said when you said that you had this urge that you could create the world that you wanted. Yes. Right? Yes. And I think it's so important that you that you used the word create mm -hmm. because I think people think that life just happens to you. Yeah. And it doesn't. Like you actually create it. Right? The life you want. Oh. Book and I would talking about an identity, do you think you know who you are today? Um, well, I know myself better than I did yesterday. Like every day is like there's something new to discover. And I think that's what keeps life interesting. Um, I'm never completely sure of myself. And I think that gives, you know, a, a, you know, space to always improve. You know, I'm never completely sure about myself and I'm always trying to be better. So every day I discover something new. Yeah. Well, and then in 2004, you released Derating. Yeah. I actually just paid it now. And I'm a Kosa, I'm a Twana girl. Mm -hmm. But that song for me says, you will say to us in the world that you're, you are ready for greatness. Yes. You are ready for your power. Yes. You are ready for your purpose. and. We Tembalani, you are my hope and my trust is in you. And that's God. Right? Mm -hmm. Am I right in what was going through your mind at that time, like when you wrote that song? I wrote that song in, in frustration, actually. I had been in Joburg since 2000, and I wrote that song in 2002. Um, late 2002. Um, I got into Joburg and I was a bit lost for a while um, because the kind of person that I am, I couldn't see reflected in any of the music I was seeing around me. Um, and I was blessed enough to come to Joburg and be introduced to all of these amazing um, musicians, you know, but their style was not, so they couldn't really help me. Um, and I felt like a little bit lost until I found a crowd of people that are just like me. Um, even though they, they did other art forms, but you know, the underground music scene, people that are called woke now, conscious, you know, people that um, subscribe to black consciousness, artists like poets, um, visual artists, Singers, you know, that's where I met Abu Lebu Mashile, Abu um, Dumi and the volume, Abu um, MXO, MXO, like it was 2000 at that time, like that kind of crowd. And I felt at home. 
But then that also made me realize that I would have to create a sound that was me. It didn't exist, right? So when I wrote that song, it was out of that. When I'm frustrated, I'm frustrated. Um, you know, I'm, I'm still that oddity that I was as a kid, right? And I need you, God, to be the wind beneath my wings as I venture on this. I'm ready. Sure. Yeah. Well, I love that. Oh, you created a sound for yourself. Yeah. No, but with the help of an of, of amazing artist. Um, because while I was in that space of, you know, confusion, a friend of mine bought me an album. And this album was like from Gallo Records of old song from the 14s, 15, a song called Marabi. So the first song that I heard from that album was um, by Dorothy Masuka, Masuk. And it went like, Cherry, 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 go on, go to the boy, and gain you meaning, cherry, one, so you go on, but like that song. And then there was also on that album, Miriam and the Skylark, the Manhattan Brothers. Um, like so many groups from that era. And I was like, this sounds like me. These people feel like they have the same background as, as me and therefore natural progression was that for them. And I was like, okay, so I'm not strange for thinking that this kind of stuff is music, you know, because for a long time I was very unsure, you know, what, you know, what if people don't like a kind of music I will put out, you know, how I approach music. And that moment for me was defining because it means, no, you are not an oddity. You know, you belong to a certain group of people and and the sound that is inside of you is just fine. So go on, write. So I started writing after that. But I think for me, like, there's so much power because because you had to find your identity, mm -hmm. right? And you started loving Simpiwe. Mm -hmm. You started loving Sinatemba from such a young age. Mm -hmm. You were able to find your voice, find your own sound, and say, this is who I am, mm -hmm. and I love me, and I'm going to release it. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And for me, it's sort of like a 360 moment that ha had you possibly not have gone through that identity moment with yourself, you would have probably just released music to be like. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think I could have, hey? Um, no, I, I don't think I could have um, released music just to be liked. Because, first of all, I'm way too shy, right? So if I do something, it has to be real. I, I can't fake it. I just don't have it in me. That's why I was frustrated. Because, you know, I, I remember uh, Oskida was my neighbor at some point, so I used to go and hang out there, like I literally just across the road, so I would walk across to his place. And and I'd be like, Oskido, you need to sign me. You need to sign me. You know, I'll, 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 I'll write them the songs. And then Oskido would say, but, but uh, my babes, you can't even dance. I'm like, but I don't want to do dance music. He's like, I don't know what you want. And even to myself at that time, I wasn't sure like what I was going to produce, but I knew that I did not fit in any of the spaces that were available at the, at that time. Yeah, mm -hmm. I love it because for me that takes identity to a whole other level. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It says I I know who I am and. I love you. <laughs> Do you still have that fire, that drive in your purpose that you had when you released your first album? I don't think um, it's it's ever stopped. Also, the reverence that I have for my gift. Um, every time I start a new album, I feel like I'm doing it again for the first time and I get so stressed. But 
How did I even write that last album? Oh my gosh, I, I feel I get so overwhelmed um, because I take my gifts so seriously that I always start from a point of not knowing. Mm. Love that. So quite recently, you've lost your mom, <clears throat> and I'd like to please read you something. <clears throat> I wrote this song when my mother passed to accompany her on her journey. My mother's influence on my career is so vast that I write a song for her in all of my albums. This one is the most painful I've ever had to write, and it gave birth to the Moya Project. It is as graceful as she was. I don't know if I will write another song for her anytime soon. Enjoy this offering that comes from a thing that haunt, Moya 2023. Can you please take us through that moment? Where were you when you heard of your mom's passing? Um, my mom passed away in my car. I was rushing her to hospital. Um, she had reacted badly to the vaccine because she had a weak heart. And there had been no proper education with regards to you know, how it affects people's different ailments, etc. So she stayed with me for three months while we were trying to fight. Um, her, her weak heart. And on the day that she passed, I had actually gone to, to go get her medicine. And the queue was longer than usual. And on my way back, she called and she was asking how far I was. And I was like, ah, no, I'm on my way now. And as I got closer, just these traffic lights, they were red. And then you know, like when they are red, you slow down. And then they changed to green. So as I was slowing them, then I started to speed up again. Then there was a person crossing the road, but not looking at the traffic, looking the other way, you know, and I tried to brake, but I hit her. Mm. But very light, because I wasn't driving that fast. So she was fine, but you know, the law is take the person in, yeah. um, get them checked, you know, leave your license, and like all of that information, sign a form. So that happened. So now instead of getting home, I had to find a hospital to take this, this person to and sign all of those documents. Um, by the time I got home, I literally had maybe seven minutes. I got there and I could see how bad she was, put her in the car tried to rush. I didn't even wait for an ambulance, tried to rush, but I think within three minutes of being in the car, she was gone. So that's how I lost my mom. How do you deal with the loss of base design that you saw as we were? I, yeah. I don't know. I'm still figuring it out. Um, you know, um, we, or rather, let me speak for myself. I always had this thing that if life got too tough, I can always go back home to my mom, you know, so her no longer being there, um, just left me lost a bit. Um, I think writing Moya made me accept and made me appreciate what her life meant to me what it did 
for me. And letting go is hard, but uh, other thing that has helped is that I know I can still reach her. I'm a spiritual person. She comes to me in my dreams. Um, when I pass her, I speak with her, you know, and I get answers. So the understanding that she may be gone physically, but spiritually she's still there, has been like a balm to my soul. Um, so I accept, but I feel like I don't have to let go. Ah. We just have both system, you know, at this time. Um, my sister, my partner, and I won't say my children because, you know, parents should not, you know, um, depend emotionally on children like that. But they are a sense of comfort and purpose for me knowing that I have to be strong for them um, and knowing that they understand that I'm also an emotional being, psychological being, um, but most importantly, the, the purpose, you know, where I have to raise healthy kids, well-balanced kids emotionally, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I do have friends as well. Um, I have a very small circle. It's grown smaller as I grow up, yeah. I grow older. But it is of high quality. Do you blame yourself for maybe like taking that along? Do you feel like you could have done something else, maybe like to possibly save her life? I think I will always do. I will never feel like I did enough. Um, I'm like, what if I had, what if, what if, you know, I, I brought her up to Joburg immediately when she fell, fell ill. I mean, she got COVID and I was frantic, sending a, a hundred. My mom had, um, what's the word, retired. She was old enough. She was, you know, of pension age. But because of the kind of person that she was, she still wanted to avail herself as a nurse. My mom was a nurse. So, you know, she was working during COVID. She said, no, these people need us. And I said to her, mom, you also are vulnerable because she had sugar. We didn't know about the heart problem, but like she had um, diabetes. She was like, no, but these people need me. I'm going to be okay. So when she got COVID, I was freaked out. You know, I remember I sent her this tinctures, Shonyani tinctures and this and this and that and a hundred different other things. And she was fine. So when she got ill now, you know, and I heard, well, okay, she's not well. I then took her, brought her to Joburg. I've always wanted her to come and stay with me because I felt I was, I could look after her. I wanted to give her the comfort that she had afforded me. But she was adamant. She loved her house. You know, she couldn't leave her sister. They were just the two of them now. They were very close. Um, so when I brought her up here, you know, this is high time during COVID, right? And to go to a hospital, um, she stayed there for a week. It was better, it was safer at home than at hospital during COVID. Um, and I do feel like there is so much more that I could have done. But at the same time, I know that um, I'm lying to myself. You know, that th those guilty feelings are only because she didn't survive. Mm. How do you rediscover your life as St. Pewitt after losing her? And are you now questioning your identity and your purpose and your truth? No, 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 no. I'm not. Um, I left home at 14, 15. Um, 
And when I say left, as in I went out there to make something of myself when I went to boarding school because my home life was, the, the environment was abusive. My father was abusive. Um, and my, my mom was that typical victim who always finds excuses why she can't leave. Ah, oh, you guys will blame me. Say that I took you away from your father when you get older. Really? When we will talk about it. So I decided that I needed, as Sina Temba, to be the hope for the family, like I had been. You know, I'm a parentified child. You know, I had to take care of my siblings from an early age, fix things around the house. All of this was on me. So naturally, I felt if my mom cannot fix this, then I'm going to have to fix it and take my siblings out of that environment by going out there and doing well, you know. So I've always, I have been by myself or, you know, someone who can stand up on their own yeah. for quite a long time. You know, my identity was shaped outside of my home environment. Yes, so my mom and I, towards the end, we were more friends than mother and child, you know, if not even earlier than that. I think we were always more friends than mother and child, you know, with the understanding, of course, that she's my mom. So there are certain boundaries. Yeah. yeah. I am um, mm -hmm. at home, and I had... Um, the firstborn was my sister, mm -hmm. and and my sister always took care of me. Mm -hmm. So I got burned when I was 11 months old. Mm -hmm. It was always sort of like a mother figure to me. Mm -hmm. And for me, as I started growing up and I was a teenager, for me it was like the responsibility that my sister took upon herself mm -hmm. as the firstborn. Surely at some point it gets to you. And it starts weighing you down. Mm -hmm. Did you ever feel like this is a lot for me? But because you're the firstborn, you still felt like it was still your responsibility to like um, back it up for like your loved ones. I I actually did rebel in my mid thirties, oh, early thirties. Not really sure. But I did rebel um, because I felt, but guys, I had done it. I've, I've done it. I took my last born, my, my mom's last born, my sister, in when she was 14, 15, you know, and, and I raised her. And I created spaces for my two other siblings, you know, to better their lives, you know, and I supported my mom, you know. So... I never really had a childhood because I'm parentified. I had to take care. You know, I remember when I was in the in the village, I had to rush back from school because in the morning I would wake up, uh, you know, bath, and then I, I I have to buy bathe my 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 sister, who must have been a few months old, change her nappies, feed her, go to school, and rush back because someone might not have changed her nappy again or fed her. You know. So I think at around like my mid, early mid thirties, I rebelled and I wanted my childhood back and I wanted no sense of responsibility whatsoever from the family. So it, it, it does happen, you know, and I think that when it, when, when it does happen, people should not find something odd about it. You know, it's psychological. We are psychological beings, right? And that inner child needs to be tended to. You know? Yeah. And when do you take care of yourself? Like when do you say, forget about everybody else. This is me. Me, Sinatem, but this is my time. Don't call me. You know? <laughs> Don't call it at me. This is my self-care moment. Well, I, I have this way of just tuning out um, my bed and just block out the world. Um, I, I never feel 
I have to respond to this now. You know, when I want my time, I want my time. Yeah. I'll get to you, you know, when I get to you, when I need my time, you know. But I'm, I'm a reclusive person generally, so I do get a lot of time to myself. Yes. Yeah. So I'm running a bit late. I'm almost done. Okay. I was burned when I was living last. Mm-hmm. Like I said to you. And growing up, I was very angry at God. Mm-hmm. You know, I was very upset at God because for me, it was just like, but I was only 11 months old. Mm-hmm. How could you allow something like this to me? Mm-hmm. To happen to all. You have similarly gone through a lot. Mm-hmm. You've gone through a car crash mm-hmm. when you were eight months pregnant. Eight pregnant, and you've gone through a divorce. Your father lost your mom. You have gone through an abusive household. Are you angry at God? No. Okay, let me correct you. I didn't marry the father of my kids. We were just cohabiting and we broke up. I am grateful for my life. Um, I shouldn't be where I am today, given where I started. It's a miracle. Um, And I'm grateful to my ancestors. I'm grateful for the gifts that, you know, I got from my bloodline. I'm grateful for my journey with God and my ancestors throughout my life. I feel blessed in many, many ways. And my psychological issues, I've dealt with them and I'm still dealing with them because obviously with the kind of background that I've had, I would definitely have psychological issues. I've, I've, I've dealt with those, you know, I live with depression and, and I feel like not all of it is just like in the blood kind of thing. Some of it is environmental. So I, I deal with that. But overall, I'm grateful for my life. And I feel like everything happened so that I could become this person that I am today. Um, um, God's plans are not our plans. Yeah. Yeah. I've got one more question for you. I know that you need to dash. What conversations are you having with God now and are they leading to your healing? Um, well, I am a healer. Um, I've always known this from when I was a kid. Um, and I'm on a healer's journey as we speak. Um, and I don't want to say that I have a savior complex because that has got negative connotations. But I feel very strongly the need to help, to help fix it. Um, and I walk that journey proudly and quietly. Uh, and I understand that healing starts with yourself. Yeah. Cannot go out there being um, avoidant of your own issues while trying to save the world. And I, and I think that's where the world savior complex comes from because usually those people, you know, don't look inward. They're always just looking out there, like kind of. Um, but yes, I healing was my calling, or is my calling, and music is my vehicle. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. If I'm your bomb right now, what would you say to me? Um, I've actually had conversations with her. Um, I told her that I'm very thankful with her many sacrifices, with her way of understanding me and helping me achieve even things that were strange to her, dreams that were strange to her, she didn't understand, but that she trusted me, 
that I knew what I was doing and where I was going, that no parent, hardly any parent, would have supported the kinds of crazy dreams that I have. I mean, I left PE at the end of my second year, forfeited a bursary, moved to Joburg, not even having a place to stay, not even having found, you know, a school to go to. And my mom was like, my child, if you feel strongly about it, God will make a way. Got in a bus, came to Joburg, um, got myself into school, you know, Within two weeks, someone just came to me and said, oh, I like you. Who are you? And when we got talking, and I was telling her that, no, I'm staying with a friend's brother. You know, my accommodation fell through. I'm staying with a friend's brother. I'm looking for a place to stay. She's like, oh, you can come stay with me. I've got an empty room. And, you know, you can pay when you can. If you can't, it's okay. My, my parents pay for it. Like that kind of, you know. But for my mom to believe that I could just forfeit a, a, a place of comfort because for the first time I didn't have to worry my bursary paid for everything accommodation books yeah. everything it even gave me a job I could go then and work anytime I wanted get paid per hour but so going back to what I said to my mom I said I was grateful for her being that kind of parent who recognized something in me and chose to support it instead of being the typical parent who's like you are being um, what's the word? Irresponsible. You know, you have a good thing going on here. Just stay here. You know, my mom allowed me to chase my dreams, even to her own detriment. Um, so I told her that I was very grateful for that, and that I hope that she was staying in the light, um, and that I was grateful for her heart, her beautiful heart that she had transferred to me. I was grateful for her um, gift of music, because it's my mom who could sing. And that she had given, she had passed on that gift to me. Um, and that I would love her forever. And I'll keep checking up on her. Mm. Some people please grab that mirror as we close. Smith Am I supposed to look at myself in the yeah. mirror? Okay. Yes. When I started seeing my greatness and my beauty and my power, mm. I had to stop looking at myself and I started seeing myself. What do you see when you look into that mirror? I see a conqueror. I see a very calm person. I see... I wouldn't say a conqueror because I see all the pain is still there. But I see a person who has transcended. Yes. Simple yes. congratulations on your new album. We are really looking forward to it. And um, a candle tried to burn me and it also tried to ruin. But that very same candle lives within me and that candle would shine your ground. And I'd like to say to you here today, Keep shining. Thank you so much, Hito. And I wish the very same for you. And thank you for being a bright light of hope and positivity. Thank you so much. And from me, Mrs. Itumining Sikubi, keep your perspective alive. <laughs>